the School of Security Studies. My name is John Gearson and I direct the Centre for Defence Studies and I'm delighted to have Sir John Soares uh, joining us this morning uh, to have a conversation. Um, Sir John is Executive Chairman of Newbridge Advisory, um, a firm that he set up in 2019. And after a distinguished career in the Foreign Office, um, uh, including stints as the uh, British Ambassador to Egypt and also uh, our permanent representative at the United Nations, Sir John became the 15th uh, C Chief of uh, the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about his uh, career, but also the, uh, the journey that the world has taken uh, in, in the course of, 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 uh, of his, his career. So welcome, Sir John, and thank you for joining us this morning. Well, well thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to all your, um, uh, your colleagues and students who are, who are tuning in today. And it's great to be back at King's College. I hope to be back there in person before too long. Indeed. And, and we, 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 of course, would have liked to have been doing these uh, conversations in person and online at the same time. I mentioned that you started uh, your career in the Foreign Office uh, in the late 1970s um, and with a variety of postings. But I think that's quite a good way to take us into the fact that the Foreign Office you joined in the late 1970s must have been pretty fundamentally changed by the events of 1989, uh, just, just a decade later. Um, um, all of the certainties of the Cold War changed. How did it, how did it feel on the front line? Well. Uh... Most people think about 1989 as um, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Tiananmen Square and so on. It's the great powers. I was actually in South Africa at that time um, and I was uh, <clears throat> working in the British Embassy there um, uh, on the whole question of, of, of <clears throat> prodding, encouraging, pressing, uh, demanding uh, the South Africa um, bring an end to its, uh, uh, its apartheid system uh, and promote uh, change there. And it, it, my, my four years in South Africa from beginning of 88 to the end of 92, it bridged sort of rock solid state of emergency, repression, apartheid, through to a real aspiration of hope with the release of Nelson Mandela and political prisoners. And it was a, a real lesson to me of how peaceful change can be brought about uh, by a combination of uh, argument, uh, economic pressure through sanctions, uh, a degree of isolation um, and support for um, uh, communities who were uh, uh, badly in need of it, uh, both um, uh, economically and politically. Uh, and uh, there was a huge argument at the time over the role of sanctions and <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher was famously uh, pretty negative about them. But uh, on the front line, I could see that some of those sanctions weren't particularly effective, but others really were effective, especially the financial sanctions. And in some ways, the lessons uh, of what succeeded and what didn't succeed in South Africa have informed the debate about sanctions over the last 30 years. That's interesting. Um, how did those, th those lessons and, and, and those, those uh, mechanisms fare when, when you've got into your next uh, crisis in the Balkans, not so many years later? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, sanctions sometimes get a bad rap. Uh, because they do cause um, uh, widespread uh, harm. We see the, uh, the damage they do to uh, individuals and to communities and populations. Um, but they've also got areas where they've been successful. And I think the Balkans is, a, is a, an example, um, certainly towards the end of the 1990s, of how um, uh, sanctions did contribute to bringing down President Milosevic in the same way that they helped bring an end to uh, the apartheid system in, in, in South Africa. Um, again, it, it's not a silver bullet. It wasn't as if sanctions uh, were the sole answer. It was a great combination of pressure. Uh, and of course, the 1990s was a particularly bloody decade in uh, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and we approached it. I was working for Douglas Hurd uh, after I came back from South Africa. I worked in Douglas Hurd's office, uh, running his uh, private office. Um, and it was really the first post-Cold War crisis uh, in Bosnia, um, where the Americans said they didn't have a dog in the fight. Uh, the uh, European Union proudly declared that this was the hour of Europe, but didn't have much to back it up. Um, uh, that uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the Russians supported the Serbs, the Americans supported the, the Bosnian Muslims, the Germans supported the Croats, and the British and French were trying to keep the peace between them. We were really muddling through because we hadn't really done this sort of stuff. Uh, before the Cold War was completely different, it was a it was a, a fixed process, proxy wars, uh, stalemate in Europe, 
Um, and suddenly we had a, a war on the European continent where all these values and all these countries' interests were mixed in. And we didn't really have the tools to, to find a way through. Um, and lots of mistakes were made on Bosnia and, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people died as a, as, as a consequence of, um, of the conflict there. And that in some ways was a negative lesson learned of, of how long it takes to orchestrate international efforts um, and uh, how peacekeeping uh, can't be, um, if, you, if you're trying to preserve a peace, you have to establish a peace in the first place. Um, and there were some there were intellectual and policy errors made um, as well as some uh, 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 um, political errors at, at the time. In the end, I think we found our way through on the Balkans. And then, for example, the handling of the Kosovo crisis at the end of the 1990s was um, much more uh, uh, um, well considered and well judged uh, and effective than our handling of the Bosnia crisis at the beginning of the 1990s. Um, and uh, uh, my career in the 1990s took me from Douglas Hurd's office to a year at Harvard, uh, to three years in Washington, uh, running the foreign and defense policy um, uh, part of the British embassy in Washington. And then I came back and, and was uh, uh, worked in number 10 as Tony Blair's advisor. So that period of the Balkans was sort of seared through me during that, um, during those uh, during those years, uh, but we certainly learned a lot more about the importance of of, of effective military um, uh, uh, intervention, of how um, uh, the military can back up diplomacy and reinforce it, uh, and can uh, uh, can drive uh, the uh, uh, policy delivery on the ground. In a sense, that was the Kosovo was probably the high point of Western military intervention. Um, we had a successful intervention in Sierra Leone a year or so later, uh, which was also uh, uh, strikingly successful. Um, but of course, uh, then came the decade of the 2000s and the never ending wars uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the successes, the, the, the learned successes of the 1990s um, uh, 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 turned into uh, failures of the 2000s. I mean, just just before we move on from uh, from from the Balkans, I recall when when the British first sent uh, forces into Bosnia, um, the the commander went there with his with his uh, advance team and 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 said after the event that um, you know the the relationship and the working between the Ministry of Defence, Foreign Office, and others, you know, what wasn't as as good as it became later. Let's put it that way. And he, when he arrived. Um, he was told, well, there are 96 NGOs that want to speak to the British commander. Yeah. And he had sort of five staff with him. And he said, and all of those NGO organisations knew more about the situation on the ground than he did, having just arrived there. Um, and, and it took, it was quite a steep learning curve. And the impression was that, um, you know, it, it deploying force uh, for the British anyway was easier than being effective in those early, in those early weeks, you know, but because we, we hadn't done intervention, as you say, for, 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 for a long time. And we didn't, we didn't even have an embassy in Bosnia at the time. And when we did open up an embassy in, I think it was 1994, uh, the Foreign Office in its wisdom sent a particularly junior guy because he didn't have many people to manage and therefore it was a junior role. Whereas this was the, I, I was in Douglas Hurd's office um, and uh, this was the most demanding and difficult issue on his agenda. And we had um, thousands of troops there and one sort of first secretary level uh, 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 diplomat uh, as the ambassador. It wasn't his fault, but it was he was completely out of his depth. Uh, and I think this interplay between uh, politics, uh, the military uh, and well, diplomacy, the military and humanitarian assistance. We, we learned this painfully in Bosnia about how this intersects. And also to some extent in Somalia as well. And um, uh, I think one of the lessons I draw is that diplomacy didn't have a sufficiently prominent role in those crises. As soon as the military got involved, the military took over. Uh, and they claim they didn't want to take over, just the sheer scale and level of organization and sometimes force of personality meant the military did take over and the uh, diplomacy was relegated to a secondary concern. Um, uh, and, uh, but in the end, of course, Dick Holbrook in, in, uh, uh, in Bosnia and uh, the combined efforts of um, NATO leaders, particularly Tony Blair in Kosovo, showed that actually the only way through this is through political leadership. So uh, towards the end of this of this period, um, you you found yourself, um, as you said, working at number 10. Um, 
uh, at a time of, of Blair's Chicago speech, of uh, criteria for intervention, as you mentioned, a successful Sierra Leone on a small scale. Um, how, how was it speaking truth to power in those years? Um, uh, it, and, and do you think it, it took us in a direction that, that led eventually to the, uh, to the National Security Council model? Um, this was, of course, the period dismissed by some as, as so for government. Yeah, well, it, it, I have some sympathy with Tony Blair, and I do, I mean, I'm not party political. Uh, I've worked for um, uh, uh, you know, Douglas Hurd and John Major, for uh, Tony Blair and Jack Straw, uh, for Gordon Brown and David Miliband, and for uh, David Cameron and, and William Hague, uh, and each of them in their way, I mean, one day I might write a book about it, but not yet, <laughs> but each of them in their way was a, was a, a public servant and, and uh, uh, accepted advice from professionals like me, um, uh, it, it, and, and, and weighed it in the balance. And so um, I do have some, uh, in, in some ways, the, the most effective politician of them all was Tony Blair. Uh, uh, and he was uh, excellent at striking a balance between political concerns and professional analysis uh, and advice. So I never had any difficulty in providing him uh, with advice and he didn't always accept it, uh, but uh, there was no difficulty in the act of speaking truth to power. And I think the, the SOFA government bit came in because there were some members of his government who were uh, just not reliable. They just couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't resist going out and talking to the media as soon as a meeting was over. Um, and uh, in order to, um, uh, you know, we have to remember Tony Blair was uh, at one to end of the political spectrum of his political party, and there are plenty of people at the other end of the political spectrum who wanted to undermine him, um, quite apart from the, the, the TBGBs, as we call them, the row between TB, Tony Blair, and GB, Gordon Brown, um, and uh, the, uh, <coughs> which, which ran through that time. But um, I, I do think that, um, although Cameron made uh, quite a few mistakes as Prime Minister, um, I think the structure that he set up of a National Security Council was much better than the, um, uh, than the much more informal style, the so-called SOFA government decisions uh, that uh, prevailed when Tony Blair was Prime Minister. It, in some ways it was convenient for me because I was one of those sitting on the sofa yeah. and so <laughs> you didn't have a big process to go through. Um, but, uh, it, but in terms of machinery of government and uh, and um, creating an environment where, uh, as we do now at the National Security Council, you start with an intelligence briefing from the chair of the JIC. The intelligence chiefs can, can add and supplement uh, that, that briefing. You have professional advisors, you have domestic people like the Home Secretary and uh, maybe the Business Secretary around the table, along with the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary. Um, and uh, uh, you have a, a common platform of information and a, an open argument around the table in confidence uh, as to what the options are and what the consequences of the options are. And that frankly is better than relying on the uh, decisions of, of, of one individual. Of course, David Cameron didn't always follow the NSC. He took his decision uh, to have a referendum on, uh, on Brexit, only consulting his political advisors. Uh, there, was no, uh, there was no sense of where is, the, where is the national interest here? He ignored that question. Um, and uh, so even the Cameron system wasn't foolproof, but it was better than what preceded it. So, I mean, this period saw interventions, it, it, it saw national action, but also multilateral action. Uh, you, you, you moved on from number 10 in, into uh, Middle East posting and then, and then to the United Nations. Now, as, you, as you look back and you reflect, how, how have these institutions that today we are told uh, that post-war Concord Act is 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 fracturing. How, how do how do you view the, the well this the scorecard for those multilateral institutions over these twenty years or so as we move into the noughties? Well, multilateralism has institutions and it has processes. I mean, one job you didn't mention that I did was as political director in the Foreign Office, which I did for four years between um, Egypt and New York, uh, and in some ways that was really rewarding because it was the interplay between, um, basically I was in charge of doing the hard grind on policy uh, across the board for, for the foreign secretaries and for, for the government of the day. Um, and it meant using NATO, the United Nations, the European Union as ways of, of, of building coalitions, but also 
it means it's very close working with the French and the Germans as part of the E3 on, on the Iran negotiations, for example, working with the Americans, French and Germans on how we deal with Russia uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a threat in Europe um, uh, and, uh, and uh, dealing with um, uh, allies on the ground in places like Iraq and Afghanistan um, uh, and the, and the um, rather fragile structures that were emerging there um, in, in the governments there. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it, you have these, these overlapping processes. You have a domestic policy process, you have a negotiation with close allies about what is the right way to do things, and then you deliver that through the international institutions like the UN, like the European Union, the NATO, the G7, and so on. Um, and uh, being involved in that process was fascinating. Obviously, when I was political director, I was at one end of that process, um, formulating the policy and, um, uh, and working closely uh, with um, Washington, Paris, and Berlin in particular about what the Western approach should be. <clears throat> and then when I went to New York, uh, it was a process of delivering that through the Security Council or through the UN agencies or the UN system, um, uh, as my counterparts in NATO and Brussels were doing through, the, through their organizations as well. So it was a, it was a, a, a complex sort of sausage machine of, um, of you know, <coughs> issues emerging. What do we do about it? What do others think we should do about it? How do we deliver that? How do we create change on the ground? And, you know, there were successes and failures. But there's absolutely no doubt that the multilateral system in that entirety, that doesn't mean taking things cold to the United Nations and expecting a solution to emerge. It means using that entire uh, sausage machine of, 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 um, of policy analysis, of development, of processing, of negotiation, of then delivery um, <clears throat> has worked very well. And, and the UK was quite good at it. Um, and we had that intersection, as I say, of our roles in all these organizations privileged position in the United Nations, um, a leading membership of NATO and of the European Union. And one of my sadnesses about Brexit, but quite apart from the politics of it and the economics of it, one of my sadnesses about Brexit is it's removed the UK from, from that fulcral role in the transatlantic relationship, uh, which, uh, which we used to, I certainly used to hugely benefit from when I was at number 10, when I was political director in the Foreign Office, uh, and again at the United Nations. One of the areas where the EU generally has been regarded as, as, as not as central, of course, is in, is, is in matters of intelligence. Um, you went from the Foreign Office into uh, the, the, the world of, 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 of secret intelligence, um, much smaller organisation. Well, I suppose not that much smaller than the Foreign Office, but I mean smaller compared to the military that you've worked with and, and, and the UN. Um, what were the challenges that, 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 you, that were sort of highest on your list as you, as you moved in uh, as, as C? Well, I, of course, started my career at sea. I had my first tap on my shoulder mm -hmm. when I was at Nottingham University um, and uh, I'd applied for the Foreign Office, but then got sort of um, uh, uh, sidetracked, if you like, and, and channeled into intelligence. Um, well, I found after a number of years in intelligence that actually I was more interested in policy and in ideas and in politics than I was in operations and, and analysis. Uh, or, I, I, and um, uh, my natural home was in diplomacy. So I was a bit surprised when I got tapped on the shoulder again, this time by Gus O'Donnell, uh, uh, who was cabinet secretary at the time, to say, um, John, we, uh, uh, we, we, we need you to go to Vauxhall Cross to run uh, MI6. Um, and that, was, uh, that came as a, a, a surprise. I had to think about it quite hard, but I, I realized that um, the service had, the, the intelligence service, had suffered um, uh, 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 damage to its reputation um, in the aftermath of the faulty intelligence on Iraq, on uh, being close to the Americans, on uh, treatment of detainees in the counterterrorism um, uh, efforts, um, and uh, the uh, that presumption of trust in MI6 uh, had um, had uh, eroded, uh, and so I. When I arrived in MI6, I realized that my job was to modernize the organization. Um, and it, it had been run by um, uh, internal chiefs for the previous 40 years. And frankly, the MI6 I left in the, um, in the beginning of the 80s uh, hadn't changed much when I went back 30 years later. Well, the rest of the world had changed, but the MI6 had not changed very much. And I think that lack of modernization 
was part of the, the backdrop to the mistakes that it made as a service in the in the in the uh, several years after after 9/11. It had poor le leadership at the time. Uh, it uh, was um, uh, dislocated from the rest of um, of, of Whitehall, uh, and um, it it, uh, it it wasn't clear about its its role in the. Um, in that post Cold War year, and it had, it had just it, it had gone downhill a bit during the 1990s. Is the is the truth of it? So when I went in, I had I had three clear messages to the service, which I summed up each in one word. One was reputation, second was alignment, and the third was delivery. Reputation was about restoring trust and confidence in the service that we had to modernize our methods, we had to account for ourselves better um, to ministers, to parliament, to our partners in the intelligence community uh, and uh, to, uh, to the media uh, as necessary. Um, and rebuilding that reputation was essential. Uh, the second uh, was uh, 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 alignment. We had to be much closer to the customers and to our partners in intelligence creation than we had previously been. There was a certain sort of dare I say, a slight arrogance in MI6 about the, um, uh, and pride, justifiable pride in the organization. But the, the quality of the operation was more important than the impact uh, that it was having on policy. Uh, and the sense of separation was valued uh, in, in, historically in the past, whereas actually you only have an effect as an intelligence agency if you're very clear who, you know, what people need, what decisions are coming up, how your intelligence can act as a platform to better inform the policy making that's done either at senior official or at ministerial level. So alignment with the rest of government was, was, was essential. And the third was delivery. Um, that uh, we had a record of, of producing good intelligence uh, with some uh, you know, major um, uh, shortfalls on uh, on Iraq in the run up to the, in the, the Iraq the Iraq War, but uh, that's a big shortfall I know. But the intelligence was good, but the intelligence environment was changing. It was becoming much more technology focused, and uh, we we're at the early stages of the digital revolution. I don't take personal credit for this. There are some very able people inside the service who realized that actually we need to divert our attention uh, less from that sort of human um, uh, personal relationship as the foundation for building an intelligence relationship. We need to rely much more on data. And the counterterrorism world actually was uh, was was where we uh, where we where we led this. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, the tradition of MI6 was that the, the James Bond figure, the case officer in the field, uh, was, the, was the, um, uh, the key person in any intelligence operation, a bit like the fighter pilot, um, uh, and has a massive support team, but the fighter pilot in the RAF is the person who uh, is the, uh, has the highest status. And we, we realized actually the most important person in any operational team was the data analyst. Uh, and it was the data analyst uh, who, who could pull together the data, interrogate it, work out who we needed to be targeting, where the weaknesses were in an opponent's defenses, uh, where the eight points of access might be. Um, and the case officer simply did what the analyst basically told him to do, him or her to do. Uh, and uh, I think that was a revelation, uh, a revolution rather, revelation to some as well, uh, on, on how intelligence works. So those are my three messages, reputation, alignment and delivery. I mean, in these in these years and in the and in the decade before you became C, of course, the, the, the another huge change for MI6 was the close working with with the with the military in the in these long term deployments and 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 some of your well later your staff but some of your predecessors as well you know have talked about how those relationships have been lost in in in, in the decades before um, sort of perhaps Cold War relationships which obviously were close where the the est the, the assessments were all about. Uh, the military challenge in many respects in the politics but by, by by the 2000s it all had to be rebuilt and 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 the, the the question has been raised a number of times at king's is um as we've moved away now from these big deployments um how will that be maintained i mean are you confident that that that, that intelligence's close alignment with with the, with the rest of whitehall um can survive a non-operational decade or two well, well, John, I don't think we should um, uh, create another war just to make sure that the intelligence and military communities are, are working closely together. It's certainly true that in a time of crisis, whether it's an existential 
Cold War crisis like uh, we had with, with the Soviet Union, uh, or a hot crisis as we had in the Balkans and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, that they, <clears throat> they generate, uh, you, only, you only survive and, 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 and prevail if you can integrate all your assets. And actually, one of the things we're witnessing in the United States in the failures um, of, of some of their policies in, uh, um, uh, is that failure to integrate all the, all the different aspects of, um, of American power to make it more than the sum of its parts. Um, I, I think we could say that that's part of the problem they're facing in Afghanistan at the moment. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I think for the UK, um, uh, I've been, like most of you, I expect, I've been studying and working on the integrated review, which came out uh, last week. And I think this, uh, just the very title, this, the understanding that efforts on diplomacy, on the military, on intelligence, on development, they do need to be integrated across a single policy if you want to be really effective. Um, I mean, Diffid, uh, who I have a lot of admiration for um, uh, uh, and, and uh, the, the work they did, they, they, they spoiled it slightly by having a rather sort of isolationist view of themselves, a bit like MI6 in the 1990s, um, that they thought that they were a bit different, that they didn't have to obey the rules of everybody else. Now, I frankly uh, uh, have reservations about this complete dismantling of DFID and its integration into the FCDO, um, because I'm not sure if that is going to um, uh, uh, enable uh, that high reputation and thought leadership that DFID had in the international development community. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that will be able to continue. But on the intelligence side, um, I, I think, I, I hope that one of the legacies that I left behind uh, 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 in the service after I, I left, I know Alex Younger certainly has taken it forward and I think Richard Moore wants to as well, um, uh, is that sense that we are only part of a whole. We are only one cog in the machine. Um, and whilst we do some very unusual things and we have some you know, brilliant people and some <coughs> legal um, uh, 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 powers to, uh, it, that we can use in the right conditions, which, which make us a, you know, um, take us into dangerous places uh, to do very difficult things, um, we are nonetheless just one part of the government machine and we should never lose sight of that. And I think the military are sort of learning that as well. Uh, and the fact that they're not, you know, struggling in the, the markets of Basra or the uh, or the or the um, uh, you know the hot and dusty parts of Afghanistan, um, uh, <coughs> they're going to be deployed in smaller uh, units. They're going to be much more technology dependent, uh, and that's the sort of revolution which the intelligence community has gone through as well over the last ten years. And I think this shared use of, of uh, technology platforms, this shared deployment in relatively penny packets uh, in different parts of the world to do leadership, education, intelligence um, uh, building, training uh, in an integrated way, uh, I think will help keep up those, uh, those, um, uh, those relationships. But obviously they won't be as close as when you're working on some nighttime operations in uh, Baghdad and going from you know, a, a, an MI6 officer going with a special forces unit to attack a, a particular um, um, ISIS or whatever uh, holdout um, and getting intelligence there, using it again and going on to the next target two hours later and going on to the next target two hours after that. That develops a sort of blood brotherhood um, in battle uh, that you can't replicate, but we don't want to have those battles in order to just replicate that uh, that spirit. I mean, it's interesting what you say. Obviously, everything's becoming technologically enabled. I guess traditionally, though, MI6 called itself uh, a human organization. Um, you seem to be describing uh, a, a future that, that that is probably going to be not just uh, technology enabled, but 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 tech technology centered. Um, is this the beginning of the end of, 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 of the distinction of intelligence? Emphatically, no. Um, uh, the um, uh, signals intelligence, SIGINT and, and technical intelligence can tell you what people are saying to one another. They can tell you uh, what is being written down or being communicated from one person to another. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't tell you what's inside the head of people. And what human intelligence tries to get at is intent. As we always say in our business, uh, threat is a combination of capability and intent. Um, SIGINT and military intelligence can tell you a lot about capability, 
but it's human intelligence and only humans that can tell you about intent um, and what people are really thinking. Now, we don't always get it right. It's an art as much as it is a science, but that is the essential element that MI6 brings to, um, uh, to uh, <clears throat> thinking about risk and threats and, uh, and, and challenges that, that, that we face. Now, <clears throat> what is the role of technology in that? Well, I've described the role of data analytics in planning operations. Okay. If you want to penetrate um, the, you know, the Iranian nuclear weapons program or the uh, Chinese cyber program, you need to have that facilitated because you can't, you don't meet these people at cocktail parties. You don't, uh, uh, you, know, you don't have access to them like we had some access to the Russians during the Cold War. Um, uh, uh, where you had uh, diplomats and negotiations and international organizations. In order to access these people, you need it to be technology facilitated. And also the, the, uh, uh, the way technology has evolved with, um, uh, 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 with very strong surveillance capability um, uh, in places like Russia and China, indeed all around the world, there's much stronger surveillance capability. It's just not restrained by <clears throat> the law or privacy or human rights in, in places like Russia and China. Um, well, that actually gives an advantage to the home team um, uh, that uh, the MI5s of this world are in a stronger position with that uh, technology than the MI6s of this world are. Um, as we, as, as you know, we're the ones who have to go out and forage in difficult places. Um, and the MI5 play defense at home. Now, theirs is a very important role, um, uh, but uh, uh, the new technology environment means that the traditional means of um, uh, you know, false identities and uh, um, you know, false credit cards or whatever, uh, they, don't, they don't last more than five minutes in a modern hostile environment. It needs your offensive operations, your intelligence collection operations have to be intelligence uh, facilitated and intelligent, uh, sorry, technology facilitated and technology protected uh, as you go out and operate them. And during my time, uh, I, I think when I arrived in, in MI6, in a space of just five years of my leadership, um, we uh, moved uh, the proportion of our effort that went on technology facilitation from about 35% of the government of the agency's resources to just shy of 50%. Um, and uh, I realized early on that <clears throat> my predecessor's goal of building the service by increasing the manpower was actually the wrong goal to be pursuing. That a bit like the army today, you actually needed fewer people, but more capability and more technology, uh, in, more investment in technology and different skills in order to deliver more output. Just having okay. more people that wouldn't, wouldn't achieve it. Well, I was going to, actually going to ask you about how did you find the, the challenge of recruitment and of diversifying your workforce when, 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 when you were there? I mean, is it still work in progress? Well, I, I think it's a bigger work in progress now. Um, I mean, as I say, my goal was to, um, uh, uh, the, the biggest goal wasn't building up the size of the service. We needed to keep on recruiting. We needed to recruit different people. And... <clears throat> The old method, I, mean, I was recruited by the tap on the shoulder uh, at university. Um, there's still a bit of that going on, but the, the risk is that, um, that you end up recruiting people who are you know, traditional, traditionally seen as, as, as intelligence officers. When I joined, I was, I was, uh, I was diversity. Uh, I went to a comprehensive school. I went to a red brick university. I studied science. Uh, this was not the normal sort of person that MI6 recruited in the 1970s who'd gone to public school, Oxbridge, done PPE or the classics or whatever. Um, and uh, it, it was a different approach. But the John Sewers style diversity was not good enough because I was um, uh, 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 white, middle class and male. Um, uh, uh, and many of the demands of the service were for people with much more diverse human skills, intellectual skills, personal qualities and who could mix in and build relationships with people uh, who are very different. And so uh, women were a hugely important part of our operational um, component and made us much more effective. We weren't recruiting women just because it was the right thing to do and to be fair. And to, but actually women were vastly better at some operational targets, uh, tasks than, than men were. Now I'm generalizing obviously, um, uh, but uh, uh, and, and likewise, if you have people from <clears throat> ethnic minority backgrounds 
it takes people by surprise. They're not expecting that a British intelligence officer uh, would be a, a black woman with a baby. Uh, but a black woman with a baby can be a much more effective cover uh, for an intelligence person <coughs> than being a, <coughs> a former military officer who's transferred from the guards into uh, into MI6. Mm. I mean, you, you, you hinted about uh, um, targets for intelligence operations, of course. Um, you mentioned the integrated review. Um, I wonder if you might say something about uh, this debate about China uh about whether it's an opportunity or a threat and i suppose uh russia which you've, you've touched on um but also our alliances um we we we've gone through a period of of qu quite significant uh questioning of of some of those structures and under the trump administration uh the biden administration hasn't settled in yet um the bridges have set out their their, their stall uh in these in these documents over the last two weeks um, are we getting it right? I mean, where, where are you on, on how we should treat China, for example? Well, I, I thought, that, first of all, I thought the integrated review was a, a really professional effort, and I commend the work that's gone into it. I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, as, as you and your colleagues know, I wasn't in favour of Brexit. I think it's, a, it's a, an act of self-harm by the UK, but we've done it now, and now we've got to make the most of it, and we've got to find the right way forward. Um, and there are areas where, where there will be advantages, there will be more openings. Um, I, I think the um, uh, review was measured on China. Uh, it, uh, its language was in some ways more European than it was American. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the, the specific paragraph does balance the threat to our security and our values from China with the importance of trade and, and uh, uh, investment opportunities. Um, but if you take the review as a whole, China permeates through it. Every reference to technology, every reference to uh, human rights and our values, um, uh, every um, uh, refuge to, refuse, uh, reference to um, uh, uh, you know, economic um, standards and, uh, uh, and so on, these are all direct or indirect references to China. Um, and clearly, the most of the biggest transformation in the world in the last 20, 30 years has been the rise of China. It's an obvious thing to say. Um, but I do think China's taken a different direction recently. <clears throat> in the 1990s, there was still a debate going on in China about um, how open they should be and what direction they should take. And in some ways, in a very ugly way, Tiananmen Square in 89 was an open manifestation of this this battle going on inside China <clears throat> and Hong Kong and the one country, two systems um, left open the possibility that China could become a bit more like Hong Kong as well as Hong Kong becoming a bit more like China. But I think iron entered the Chinese soul at, uh, uh, in, after the financial crash. I think around that time, they concluded that America was in decline that the Chinese system was better than the American system <clears throat> and that China's rise was inevitable and they didn't need to make compromises to the West. And by the time Xi Jinping came to power, that was deeply established as the received thinking in China. And, and, and Xi was chosen because he was a, a, a representative of that school of thinking. And <clears throat> we're now in a situation where uh, China um, is much more assertive the days of hide and bide of uh, long gone. Uh, uh, in some ways, the Trump era has reinforced their conviction that America is in decline. We will see what happens through Biden and what happens after Biden, um, because the Chinese think in decades, not just in four year periods of Western governments. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, and I do think that uh, China is a systemic challenge, it's a systemic rival. Um, now, the Chinese system is not one of invading other countries. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in a sense, they're more subtle than that. Um, you know, I'm sure your students start their studies with Sun Tzu uh, and uh, you know, old theories of, um, of uh, uh, Chinese warfare, where you, you maneuver your opponent into <clears throat> defeat before without shooting, a, without firing a shot. Um, the, uh, 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 I think that is still part of the Chinese mentality. But the range of powers that China has, um, economic, uh, technology, increasingly military, their determination 
to uh, separate themselves from the Western system, which we will see, I think, we're obviously seeing now in the technology world, I think we will see over the next 10 to 15 years in the financial world as well. They do not want to be dependent upon the dollar that creates too much um, uh, vulnerability for them. Um, and they do want to draw other countries into a dependent relationship with them. Uh, Xi Jinping has been open about this. He wants to ensure China is less dependent upon foreign countries and that foreign countries are more dependent upon China. Uh, and, and that is a strategy they're pursuing. And we see what happens to um, uh, countries in Southeast Asia, but take Cambodia and Laos or, or whatever, uh, what happens um, uh, there when they become completely dominant on China, China dictates their, 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 their politics. You know, it's a case like Australia, which are economically dependent uh, upon China, biggest trading partner, um, and they become the, the target of very severe bullying by uh, China. I think for us in Europe, my concept of China is it's essentially a, a land power. Yes, we talk about the South China Sea and the first island chain and these sort of um, uh, ideas of, of how China is projecting its power in a naval sense. But Britain and America, for obvious reasons, were great powers through our maritime capability. I think China is focused more on uh, the Eurasia landmass. It sees itself as essentially a land power that wants to dominate the Eurasian landmass. Uh, and at their end of it, they're making a very good job of that. And we're sitting at the other end of the Eurasian landmass. Um, and uh, at the moment, the European economy is about the same size as the Chinese economy, a bit bigger. Um, but if we got to the position that Australia's in, and our economy in Europe was just a third or a quarter the size of China, then I think China would treat us like they treat Australia. And that is something we need to really think in, uh, think about in a long-term strategic way. And I think the integrated review makes some good moves in that direction. Right. Well, well thanks, John. I think we'll move on to some questions because uh, I've had I've had uh, too much of a go so far. Uh, I, I mean, first of all, um, my colleague Professor Vigano in uh, uh, Natural Mathematical Sciences asks: um, Are we getting cybersecurity and general security in cyberspace right, in your opinion? Well. Uh, this is a, a rapidly moving target, and it's something which I talk to a lot to my commercial clients in my new uh, advisory role. Um, and each time we think we're making progress, uh, we do good things in this country, like setting up the National um, Cybersecurity wow. Center. Uh, uh, we set out uh, uh, basic minimum standards for companies to abide by, and, and all this helps improve cyber hygiene, cyber awareness. Every big company has this as a as a top risk on their board agenda. But then things like solar winds happen uh, and you have an operation, which um, I'm uh, assured by my former colleagues uh, uh, originated from Russia. Uh, uh, it probably involved over a thousand Russian software engineers uh, to uh, manage this operation over a period of nine months to a year. Um, uh, it's a massive operation uh, and they had access to tens of thousands of entities um, uh, uh, and were able to pick and choose the hundred or so they really wanted to strip bare uh, over the period of nine months that they were in. Uh, and this is a scale of operation that we've not seen before. And we talked about sort of wanna cry, the North Koreans sort of uh, throwing their, um, uh, uh, their, their fairly basic skills and seeing what they pick up. We talked about NotPetya, the Russian attack in Ukraine, which went viral and brought down a number of major companies. Um, and that was three, years, three or four years ago. But we're now in a new realm with solar winds. Uh, uh, of a highly sophisticated cyber attack uh, um, uh, uh, orchestrated, could only be orchestrated by uh, a hostile government. Um, and we've seen with the recent attack on Microsoft, uh, 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 a, a similar attack possibly coming from, uh, from, from China, um, that the scale of state threats is getting greater and greater. So uh, I, I, I was struck in the integrated review about the um, uh, a, a cyber operations center, a, a, a cyber force, I think it's called, um, uh, which it, to my mind is a way of being clear that we have offensive cyber capabilities as well as defensive ones. I think we need to get into a world of, um, uh, of uh, cyber deterrence. Uh, I think we need to be clearer about our doctrine on cyber. Uh, and I think one of the things that we can do during the Biden administration is bring together a small group of democratic allies to work out what we really think, what our posture really is on cyber, 
uh, and, and, and communicate that to hostile powers and to hostile crime groups or, 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 or terrorist groups to be clear that um, uh, there are certain uh, uh, barriers here, certain thresholds uh, uh, above which uh, there will be consequences. Um, mm -hmm. You have to uh, what the, set out what those consequences are. But I think there's, uh, the technology keeps on advancing, but our doctrine and policy is struggling to keep up with it. Thank you. Um, Brian McLeod, on, on a sort of national security structures question, um, uh, points out that, that the, the structures, even with the NSC, seem to move and change and evolve with each prime minister. Uh, of course, they have to to some extent. But she asks whether those, those, those strategic decision making structures ought to be a little less flexible and that prime ministers need to be to be guided into a, cer a certain system rather than being able to you know, share the role of cabinet secretary with the national security advisor yeah. on a whim uh, and then change their mind. I mean, I, you know, do we have structures that are worth uh, embedding uh, um, for the future? Well, it's, it's a valid question, but um, in some ways, I have great admiration for the way in which the Americans have embedded their interagency process um, and the way in which uh, when, when I was working in the embassy in Washington in the 1990s, I could um, uh, uh, feed into my uh, contacts in the, in the Pentagon at uh, Langley in the in Foggy Bottom at the State Department in the NSC at the White House uh, and in various congressional ears, what British concerns were in knowing how that interagency process would come together. Um, and uh, it really worked really effectively, much more so in a sense than the British um, interagency process, which didn't really exist at that stage. Um, then, of course, along comes Donald Trump. And, uh, uh, you know, you try telling Donald Trump, uh, you've got to um, listen to this uh, intelligence review, you've got to weigh the views, he just throws it out of the window. Um, and one of the, one of the reasons why uh, America made a, a, a a, a catalogue of, of errors during the Trump era was because the interagency process simply collapsed. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now under the Biden administration is a much more sophisticated uh, group of people using the interagency process as it should be used. So um, uh, I think my answer to your colleague is you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And if that horse is Donald Trump, he won't drink. Uh, with uh, Curiously with Boris Johnson, uh, although he has some uh, curious or character qualities, <clears throat> he is quite admiring of the public service and he does listen uh, to people, even if you don't always see the evidence of that. And watching him um, evolve as a leader through the pandemic has actually been quite interesting to see um, how dependent he's become on scientists and uh, how the big mistakes he made early on in the process and was not listening to scientists enough and how the big thing he's got right which is the vaccine program how he is listening to scientists um, uh, and, and entrepreneurs he listened to them at the right time on the right issue thankfully um, uh, I, I think we it is right to develop these interagency processes we've got the JIC the Joint Intelligence Committee which has existed for I don't know 50 years or more, you probably know better than I do. It's 70 years, I think the JIC has existed for. Um, we've got the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Chief of Defence Staff overseeing all the military. There's very good military civilian integration there. We've got the National Security Council. I think these are all good structures to use in government, um, but you've got to have ministers who actually respect them and want to use them. Thanks. Uh, lots of questions coming in now, so I'm going to be, be short and, uh, and, and try and throw a lot, a lot of curveballs at you. So Dale Addison asks, um, do you think things would have been different or turned out differently in Syria if the British uh, MI6 and the Chief of Defence Staff had gone down a route with political guidance or agreement rather to arm, train and equip the Free Syrian Army um, rather than the policy we adopted? The, the CDS at the time, David Richards and I, were very clear uh, at the National Security Council, uh, that if we wanted to make a strategic difference, we needed to get involved in a, in a more substantial way. Um, David Cameron and the politicians' view, they were scarred, not surprisingly, by Iraq and Afghanistan, was that we couldn't get involved in another war, but just because we couldn't do everything doesn't mean we, we should do nothing. The trouble was we ended up with a position where we did enough in terms of arming and equipping the opposition to keep the war going, but not enough to prevail, enable them to prevail. And that was true 
uh, of, of us and the French, of the Americans, of uh, our Arab partners in the Gulf and so on. We did enough to keep the suffering going, but enough, not enough to bring it to an end. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, our advice in 2012, after the conflict had been going on for a year, was that only the sort of um, uh, interventions of uh, air zones and, um, and, and direct military engagement um, of, uh, uh, of, of protecting um, the opposition on the ground would be enough to, to, to turn the tide. Um, uh, um, unfortunately, that has proved right, but it took another, um, well, the suffering is still going on in Syria. I mean, some would say that the biggest influence of the British was to have had the parliamentary vote just before the decision by Obama uh, not to implement the red line. But uh, anyway, um, Another Sophie, Lane, Cameron's mistakes. <laughs> um, Sophie Lane asks, you've touched on this a little bit, but she, she, with regard to the integrated review, um, why is there so little reference to Europe, Brexit and the Commonwealth? Uh, well, um, well, there are two different questions. Um, yeah. uh, the, the big sort of um, the, the ghost at the feast is the European Union. Uh, and uh, one of the drivers, along with China and technology, uh, of the review is Brexit. Um, and uh, uh, whilst the review is quite strong on, um, uh, 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 on the United States, on NATO, on working with France and Germany and Italy and Ireland and so on, it, it, it really underplays the importance of the European Union. Uh, I think there's a post-Brexit hangover on both sides of the channel. Uh, we're seeing it in this vaccine row, we're seeing it over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and frankly, uh, in a world which is as contested as it is, we, we both sides need to get over this hangover. Um, uh, we have common values with uh, our continental colleagues. Uh, we have very similar uh, approaches to business and to uh, international standards. Uh, we, we have a similar view of the world. We really do have to get beyond Brexit, um, but I fear, for political reasons on both sides of the channel, um, uh, that both sides at political le level will continue to pick at each other, will continue to pick the Brexit scab so that it can carry on bleeding uh, uh, for both sides' political advantage. Mm. It's not a pretty picture. All right, a number of, of observations and questions about, about China, which I'll sort of group together a little bit. Um, T Thomas Duffy uh, was interested in, in your suggestion of, of China as a, as a Eurasian power. Of course, the US and others have noted that the Chinese Navy has expanded dramatically uh, in, in the last years. But, but he asks, if they are land power, um, should we expect this Chinese naval, the PLA navies, uh, to crest and decline uh, in, in, in effect? Um, um, because fundamentally, as, uh, you know, as you argue, they are land power. Um, and uh, an anonymous uh, questioner asks whether uh, Xi Jinping's focus is reflective of systemic behavior or rather the individual leader? I mean, you seem to suggest that China had changed before he became leader. And I wonder how far that, that um, it, it is the system. Yeah, well, let me take those two. I mean, uh, China's not gonna roll back its investment in, in the Navy. It, it wants to be um, an, a maritime power as well. But I think that is a way of extending um, its uh, area of, of uh, defense. It, it wants to have a sort of quite a, you can't have a sphere of influence on the, uh, in maritime waters, but uh, it does want to control the South China Sea. It doesn't want the US Navy to be um, patrolling between Taiwan and the mainland as it, as it did 20 years ago and now can no longer do. It wants to be able to push back its opposition further away so that they, China's got greater freedom uh, within, particularly within the first island chain uh, of operation and that it, it controls and dominates uh, those uh, those areas. Um, so I, I think they'll continue to want to do that. I think the string of pearls um, approach, there's still something going on about that in the in the Pacific, uh, sorry, in the Indian Ocean uh, with uh, efforts in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, uh, Djibouti on the African coast and so on. Um, so uh, I think they will continue to build up their, their maritime capabilities. But I, I stick by my view that fundamentally they see things in terms of land, and that's why the Belt and Road is so, uh, 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 you know, the Maritime Road, oddly, uh, um, uh, is a reinforcer of the Belt, which is stretching uh, um, China's influence across uh, across Eurasia. And on Xi, um, uh, it's a mix of the two, of course. 
And I, I do think Xi Jinping emerged through the system uh, because he and his people sort of won the arguments about the direction of, of Marxism Leninism inside the inside the party. So in some ways he's a product of that. Uh, but equally, his personal um, uh, approach, his uh, his high appetite for risk, uh, we see much higher risks being taken by Xi than we have under uh, Hu Jintao or Jiang Jimin or, or, or Deng Xiaoping. Um, <clears throat> I think there is a, a human aspect to this. I don't really subscribe to the great man theory of history, uh, but I do think leaders have a big influence on their countries um, and can can nudge things in one direction or another. And I think she is doing that in China. Uh, Zhuang Lu uh, asks, what's better for the world, a China that's open or closed to, uh, uh, to the rest of the world? I kind of know the answer. Um, you know, exactly. Well, it, it, in the long term, it has to be open. But let's not be naive about this. Um, I remember the time when um, uh, an anniversary of the uh, uh, Nanking massacre, uh, when the Chinese opened up a little portal for hostility towards Japan. And I think got overwhelmed. I mean, the, uh, if, if China had an open political system, you'd see forces of Chinese nationalism, which would be very hard for the Chinese to control and be pretty ugly uh, uh, in the region as well. Um, uh, so um, uh, each country has to evolve gradually. Um, I think it's a great shame uh, that um, uh, China is, is undermining and destroying the one country, two systems in Hong Kong. So I think there are real benefits there for China. And I think this Taiwan issue is going to become um, really uh, tough over the next 15 years because you, you'll be hard pressed to find a single person in Taiwan, let alone a political party, that wants to be incorporated back into the mainland, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, especially given the direction that China itself has taken. So it's um, uh, obviously in the long run, an open China is better, um, but it can't happen overnight. Um, but for the last seven years, it's been going in the opposite direction. Right, we're coming close to our uh, to, to our time limits, uh, John. But but a couple of uh, questions I'll throw at throw at you, and you can give very short answers if you like. So um, uh, one interesting one is is how far you think the intelligence community in Britain is well placed to support the Indo Pacific tilt if if it, if it goes ahead, which is talked about in the in the IR. Uh, uh, quite well. I, I think we've got a good reach. I mean, I I work closely with counterparts in India. Um, in uh, obviously Australia, New Zealand, part of the Five Eyes. Um, uh, and we have a means of communicating with the Chinese uh, on intelligence channels, which I think is worth using. And uh, to be clear, uh, 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 areas where we can work together, genuine counterterrorism issues, uh, but equally be clear about what our values are and what we won't subscribe to. And I think having those, uh, 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 it requires a pivot, obviously. It's basically a pivot away from counterterrorism and away from supporting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, but the but you know the people are highly adaptable, uh, and I'm sure we can do it. I'm afraid to say that uh, whilst I'd like to continue, and I'm sure everybody else would, we, we've we've come to twelve o'clock, um, and uh, you've done a great job in in fielding a range of questions. I apologise to those whose questions I haven't managed to turn to, although they're still in the chat function. Um, so, John, can I thank you very much indeed. Um, Obviously, the university is delighted to have you as a visiting professor um, and, has, has, and has benefited from it for a number of years. But thank you also for today, where, where you've very gamely taken on a pretty wide range of, uh, of questions and, uh, and areas of specialisms. Uh, I think if there's a, a career to, uh, uh, to, to look to for many of our students and friends, uh, something as diverse as, as yours is, is, is an amazing model. But thank you very, very much indeed for your time today. Well, well pleasure. Thank you. And I, I very much look forward to re-engaging in person uh, with uh, the staff and, and students at, uh, at, uh, uh, at King's and let's hope we'll be able to do that this summer. Thanks. So I'll hand over to Charlie Lederman, um, who's the convener of these, of these conversations. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, th thanks to you both. Thanks to John and Sir John for a really fascinating discussion and to all of you who asked questions. It was uh, the, the range of, dis of the discussion was, was, was really excellent. So thank you on that. Um, just a um, final sort of advertisement on the next two events that are coming up. Um, firstly, we have Moira Andrews next week, who will be talking about the interaction between law and strategy, someone who's been in the, um, in, in the seat of government and, and as a legal advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as it then was, and talking through the interrelationship between those, so particularly those of you 
we're looking for a career in law. She will provide some really fascinating insights into that. And then the following week, we'll have Kevin O'Brien will be talking to us about the role of digital security within strategy. So we've got a, a great program of events and um, it's, um, yeah, we, we want to, as many of you with us as possible, but um, just before we end, I just want to thank again, John and Sir John for a great discussion to Danielle McEvitt for, um, for setting this up. And um, yes, just um, a, a real um, highlight, I think, uh, of, uh, of our calendar this year. So, so thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.